Tonight, part one with TV's Pat McKenna talking humble starts, happy endings, and Red Green Rebooted on the all-new Possible Lodge podcast. Plus, the dirt on Marty Stevens, the magic of Sid Caesar, the wonder of Dick Van Dyke, and the tedium of Milton Berle. See, this is how I capture the youth demo. It's up all night with Bob. We got a problem. Huh? Yeah, we got a problem. Huh? We got a problem. Because I was out measuring, you know, with my spirit level, yeah. and I realize now that the, the lodge is out of plumb. <laughs> Indoor plum or outdoor plum? Both. Yeah. The whole lodge leans a little to the left. Harold, this is Canada. Everything leans a little to the left. Hey, now. Thanks for staying up all night with Bob. Ladies and folks, my guest tonight is a beloved actor and comedian whose countless film and television appearances have made him a household name, or at the very least, a household face. It is Canada. He is perhaps best known for two wildly different characters he inhabited concurrently for a time in the 1990s, the money-hungry Marty Stevens on Traders, and of course, Red's nephew Harold on The Red Green Show. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the program, Mr. Showbiz, Patrick McKenna. Woo! Woo! That guy's good. <laughs> we'll, we'll pipe in some applause, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> how are you, sir? I've been very well, actually, thanks. Yeah, I've been keeping busy, and that's all good. Well, uh, So we worked together in the early uh, 2000s on uh, Red Green. We, a gig, by the way, that both of us have, in, in, a, in a sense, picked up again. Uh, and, I, and I promised Steve, who, uh, Smith, who, whom I was just uh, communicating with this morning, and says hello. Uh, and I also promised him we'd be plugging the uh, Possum Lodge podcast. So I think we need to do that. Uh, tell us just a little bit about your part in the, in the, in the new podcast and, and how it varies from the old one. And, you know, just well, it kind of, you know, what I, like about the, uh, what I like about the podcast, it seems to just pick up right where we left off with the show. You know, so it's I'm still Harold. I still have that relationship with Red uh, because you can't see me. It's so much easier just to be the characters. It's like it truly remember it, it always kind of was a visual radio show, you know, yes. and and now it's an actual radio show. So I think it, it actually breathes into what Steve felt originally because everyone thinks he's so cool and easy going, but he's not. He's not. He's not. He just keeps everything bottled up inside. You should try that, Harold. So the, it's very fresh for me just to drop right back in there. You're absolutely right. The show was as much a radio show in, in its way as it was a, a a TV show. Obviously, there were there were remotes and all the handymans and the adventures and all that. But so much of what occurred on the show was things that were happening off screen that people were essentially coming in and saying, "Mr. Benny, Mr. Benny," right? I mean, exactly. That, that was really the sense of it. And I and Steve and I discovered a shared love of old radio in general bob and ray especially yeah i'm an enormous fan. Yeah. but this is partly I, I really am getting a huge kick out of it because for exactly that reason it is you're essentially leaning into what was always great about it which is the radio of it and also there are some new characters uh, along which is really fun there he's kind of expanded the world so i'll put a little plug in from there but i you, you know yeah. one of the segments you've been doing on the show is uh kind of looking back and listen and uh, on on prior segments and almost doing like a like a commentary see what i mean mm -hmm. you know when i watch that i just think if you knew anything about show business our tv program would have been so much better well yeah because if i knew anything about show business you wouldn't have been on it they're, they're kind of fun because it's i mean you know everything's written ahead of time but that idea that uh to read between the lines of what was going on on some of those days because you know, you, being on the set there was almost more magic in between the scenes than there was on the camera you know it was just it was great to play with all that stuff. Well, it was, and you know, we reminisced a lot. I, I mean, I was only there for for uh, well, I was there for five years, but it was yeah. Fine. But uh, but I, I, you know, uh, that how fun those tape nights were, and I don't think I realized, especially now that I've been living in Los Angeles for twelve years, and you know, worked on some worked on a couple multi cams here and stuff, just how fun that was. And yeah. how and 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 how spirited and good natured and and what a family a familial convivial I'll just keep throwing adjectives at this <laughs> until I stop talking Pat. But no, it, but it, it's it, exactly that, and it it fits so well. Like it, if it wasn't organic, it didn't really make the show. Whether it was a character or a joke or anything like that, you know. So I think that really worked. That we all just kind of fit together. The writers, the the this crew, the the actors the backstage people, it was just, a, it was a real, you're right, it was a real family feel to it, you know, and, it, and everyone seemed to respect that, which was really nice. We got a new 
doing something, Uncle Red. They're mad. They know you're a fake. Why did you make that speech? Well, Harold, they were just staring at me like they're expecting something, you know, and I didn't give much of a speech. I just said, the Silver Wasp welcomes you guys to the comic book convention. That was it. But the Silver Wasp never spoke. Oh. Wasps can't talk, Uncle Red. Duh. Here, here, here. Give him my Aquaman comic. I'm not giving you it to him. I'm not giving it to him. You'll get it. You'll get it. You'll get it. You'll get it. Well, when you're on a bad set, it reminds you how good it really was, you know, and that most bad sets don't have to be bad because I've been on a good one for 15 years. So, you know, yeah. I don't remember any bad days ever on those sets. There was no yelling, no craziness ever. So when I get on a crazy set now, it's kind of like, oh, this is this is children playing. Well, yes, and it's not and it's not necessary. Yeah, Steve wasn't. I don't think he was worrying about. I mean, all he had to worry about was his own compass of what was funny, and he's got mm -hmm. a pretty good sense of true north in that department, right? Yeah, yeah, he's very very good at that. I mean, he right from the very beginning, because when the first year we did it, and we got such bad reviews, you know, and I remember oh, thinking, oh, we're oh my god, you know, like Harold particularly was just you know way too big for TV and blah, 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 blah. And there's just that and the other thing. And, you know, it was just really put down. So Steve and I were kind of, you know, commiserating going, oh no, now what? But then he kind of firmed up and it stayed with me forever. He goes, well, it doesn't matter to me about who doesn't like it. Let's just keep making the show that people do like. The ones who like it will stay. Those who don't like it, they've already made up their mind. No sense trying to change it to bring them. They've made up their mind. Let's move on, get more people and keep the people pleased we have. And that's really been a mantra of mine ever since. You know, it's like, it's true. There's no sense chasing those people who don't like you. So when you get notes from studios and stuff like that, I kind of put in that category a little bit now of, yeah. you know, we dance on a different floor and we know different things and uh, I, I'll take it with a grain of salt now. It's it's too much to, too late in life to, to be chasing somebody else's ideas all the time. Well, so so flashback, so so before my time, I arrived in, in uh, I started contributing scripts in 2001. So, but in the late 90s, I'm going to say that Traders, which was on Global, was probably on for a good two seasons at least before I realized that uh, Marty Stevens and Harold were the same guy. We all have our roles to play. His is to do his job. Mine is to make his job miserable. It's just too bad for him. I get the fun part. I didn't, isn't that, but I was just wondering if that, if that was an uncommon experience. You must have heard that at least once. I've, I've heard it before uh, only because they started to make a lot of press about that at the time, you know, that the fact right. that I was doing these two shows. So it started to be, you know, did you know this guy is that guy? Which was actually kind of a boost for both shows. It was really an interesting time, you know, because I was just the guy doing, you know, I was lucky to get two gigs and I was working my butt off to do them. Like, two, you know, like Wednesdays and Saturdays was all red green and the rest of the week was traders. You know, so I, I had Sunday off to learn lines and that's it for like five years. It was like that. It was just go, 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 go seven days a week you know so i didn't really have time so when they started saying oh this guy's that guy and you know it was it was terrific because you know those were the days when you were on covers of tv guides and newspaper articles and you know all that's so this you were on talk shows because we had talk shows then you know yeah, <laughs> bullard yeah. and so on and strombo you could go places and celebrate these things so it was yeah. a really fantastic time but that's that's hilarious you didn't know for a while what uh, uh just on traders for a second so yeah why i mean and, and it was novel not just because you you were an actor who was on two different you know uh, hit shows at the same time but that the characters were so wildly different what was sort of like marty was a sleaze kind of right i mean yeah uh, that was kind of the idea what was like what was like the sleaziest thing he did in the, in your in your five seasons on the show oh well i mean he, he had affairs he you know he certainly stole money he undercut everybody i mean he was morally bankrupt as opposed to uh, you know Ill illegal which right. was always interesting. He was always just wanted to be, when I go for a character, I always look for their insecurity, you know, and the, the thing about Marty and, and Harold, they both had that, I want to fit in. I want people to accept me kind of thing. Oh, Marty was because he didn't go to school and have the, the education all the other guys had up in the, up the big floor. And Harold was because he wasn't one of the cool guys, you know, so it was always accept me, accept me. So they would try harder, but they both tried in different ways. That's where I used to have my fun is it's the same problem, but I'm going to attack it this way, you know, more, uh, viscerally as as Marty and more emotionally and, and and vulnerable as Harold, but the goal was the same. Please accept me. Please think I'm worthy. You know, <laughs> I find most characters are, you know, they, they are who they are, but then they put a mask on. So you got to get right. past the mask into the other into beyond the character. And those and that's when I did that. And suddenly these guys are basically the same. They just execute their wants differently. 
Did you have any of that thought process going into? Well, we, so what was the audition process with uh, with Steve? Was there one? Did he come out and see his second scene? No, I was doing uh, I was doing that character at Second City in one of the scenes, and uh, Steve came to a show, and then he contacted me afterwards and said that that character you did. Do you ever think you know maybe you and I could do something together with that? And it was like, yeah, I have no idea. You know, I'm a big Steve Smith fan. You know, I, I tried writing for him before, and he didn't like my stuff. And it's like, oh, you know, I always wanted to impress him because i really like the guy he's just one of the funniest guys i know oh, so it's yeah. we we shot that first week and i took a week during the day we'd shoot it and then i go and drive in and do second city at night we did that for a week and that was for me because he did outdoor stuff on his own but that was the whole season was just a week of that you know so and i was wow. sitting in a chair and it was dark you know we only had a couple cameras that you've seen the show the first season it's it really lifted afterwards you know there are certain things you should never do Like don't eat things that you find on your shoe Don't have a nap in the middle of the road And don't ever lick a toad Don't lick a toad, don't lick it You'd be better off to kick it Or better still, just leave it alone It wasn't bothering you no. And so we were really surprised to got a, a second and third season but the second season was, you know, one of those historical ones where so many Second City people came through and it was just a, you know, a mess because there was it just was too many fun. improvisers. <laughs> so this, I, I, yeah, I've seen less of this season, but I remember when it was on, it became a little bit more of a kind of a traditional sitcom for a yeah. brief time, right? There were longer scenes with all the, all the guys almost every character who was ever a character on the show was was there in the room um, and it was good and bad you know it was hard because everybody had a joke to end the scene on you know it was and there was some stand-ups in the room too and they 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 improvise differently than improvisers do and so it, it just you know it was just everybody was trying to top each other as opposed to being the characters you know and right. so it was, it was very difficult uh, to to navigate where it was going to balance you know even harold uh, I had to stand back because these were new characters. How are they going to fit in? You know, I can't be heralded. I got to let to see who's going to be in control. What's the status of this new environment? And it just kept changing. You know? But we got so many good characters out of it, though, too, and ideas. That, you know, th there's always gold in there somewhere. Uh, a mini game. A game of mini golf. Oh, thank you very much, though. Enjoy yourself, though. Well, I, I can't wait all day for you guys to decide. Oh, yeah, by the way mail came that letters for you well i'm off to see if anybody else is interested in a foursome <laughs> boy i thought he'd never leave <laughs> um at the very end of the show uh harold gets married to uh bonnie um now, this was my one sole, uh, sole uh, contribution to the casting over the years because i had brought uh Lori elliott to steve's attention because I'd seen her performing down at the Rivoli a bunch of times. And Lori Elliott came and played Bonnie in those last, uh, Harold's uh, fiance in those last three or four shows. She was great. She was she great. Was really I, I was doing a show the other night and someone was just, you know, talking about red, green, this, and that. Oh, and you married that Bonnie. She was perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, to them, it was a real, it was perfect. Like, oh, may you didn't have in that marriage. Just lovely that people still want that to be true. You know? <laughs> It brought me to this point where I have found a life partner and I look forward to spending the rest of my life with her. Ditto. <laughs> okay, 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 wait a second. I now pronounce you man and wife. Harold, you may kiss the bride. <laughs> On behalf of myself and the married man and the whole gang up here at Possum Lodge, Keep your stick on the ice. <laughs> but yeah, just the genius of that, of him to see that, uh, of that pairing of the two of you, for him to, from a comedic perspective, because he had already done like 100 hours of, of comedy with uh, Morag and, and, and with others on the Comedy Mill and on Smith & Smith, but to recognize, to basically go, I'm going to play the straight man in these scenes with this unbelievably funny guy here, and he's going to get a lot of the laughs and make the crowd go nuts. I mean, there's something kind of visionary about that, isn't there? Yeah, and very, um, very trusting because our relationship was unexplored. He didn't, he didn't know for sure. He just knew that the Harold character was very visual, 
that it moved around because to, he, he had the red green character, but it was so darn slow. It just wouldn't work on TV. Yeah, so right. I became the, you know, the visual portion of the show. <laughs> so it's like, keep moving, Harold, keep moving. <laughs> Movie stars are no different than anybody else. I don't know why everybody has to treat them special. Like if Sandra Bullock comes up to you on the street, what would you do, Harold? You know, she, girl, me, boy, and uh, uh, she, uh, she, and she, you know. Uh, 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 see, that's good. You'll just be yourself. And it was an interesting dynamic because oftentimes I was a straight man, and he had the crazy ideas. You know, it'd be like, "Oh, Uncle Red, you can't do that." You know, and then you go, "Oh, well, well we're going to do this." You know, so sometimes it was inverted how it would go depending on what the scenario was of who whose desire it was that week, who had the want, you know, like, did Steve have a goal or did I have it? And then you just play opposite that. But that was all unspoken. It would just be kind of, we would just uh, play it out and trust the characters, you know, never leaving the characters. And there was times when you could look Steve in the eyes as Pat and he could stern me, stern look back at me and go, don't break, don't break. Go, <laughs> okay, I'll stay here, right here, right here. Because, you, you, I mean, you remember how many times he hated ever having to do a take twice because the joke was ruined, you know, or, right, you know, right. stop talking before the punchline. Don't don't ruin the punchline. You know, all those little things that came along the way of, OK, I'm going to mess this up bad. I'm going to have to stop or get a different kind of laugh because I'm so off book. Now, you know, right. you, you're going to see that look in Steve's face of what the heck are you doing <laughs> and trusting that you'd come back around, you know, well, you know first show he'd let you go. Second show is like, we got to get this one now. <laughs> Well, we shot the show twice in one night, which was great because it, it, it saved this this kind of scurrying around on the floor, quickly trying to come up with an alternate joke in the moment, which is what I've you know discovered, obviously, is the way of uh, of doing business down here. And you, which is also why a red green taping would usually take under an hour, and a, your average sitcom taking taping down here takes about five or six, right? Yeah. So there is there's a, there's there's a lot of that. Um, well, what, the audience has heard that joke now. And we're going to let's let's now we need three or four different alternates. And invariably the alternate, because because the alternate is the new joke is, is often the one that gets the bigger laugh, not necessarily the better joke. Right. The one that they're hearing for the first time. Right. Yes. So, and that's it's a tricky thing having these studio audiences because you, you're playing two realities, you know, the camera and the live room, because you want that laugh to, you know, to sweeten the show. Um, we're going to play a little game that we play here in a second called 20 ish questions. One of the constants in 20 ish questions is this, but I'm going to break it out especially for you because this, this is my one question that comes up every week because I ask it every week and, 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 and the answer is always the same, but I think I'm going to get a different one from you. And here we go. Jerry Lewis or Don Knotts. Hmm. Wow. Don Knotts. I, I love Jerry Lewis, but uh, Don Knotts, uh, he's more character oriented. You know, he gets a little bit deeper into what he's doing where Jerry kind of surfaces. And I can be that, but I enjoy the, the. I think Harold was more like Don Knotts, you know, the insecure bravado. Oh, okay. It was more like Barney, I thought, in that way of, I think I'd probably tune into that a little bit more. But I plugged into Jerry Lewis so much. I became a huge Martin Lewis fan. Well, let's talk about that because I, 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 uh, I just, I, I always, I'm always curious to find out not just what people's influences are, but what was kind of the first thing that when they were younger that really struck them as as funny. You know, it's like that thing that, I mean, I'm not talking about Sesame Street, but like that thing where, like, for me, it was SCTV, right? Like, I was like 11 or 12 when that show was yeah. on NBC, and it was just like, like a little thing in my brain going, "Oh my God, I don't know what this is, but I want to have." do something like this you know uh, for me it was uh the dick van dyke show i remember sitting at i don't remember what uh like the episode per se but i remember there was a segment because i remember at supper i went oh it was so funny and i was a little kid and i i did this whole thing where dick van dyke was pretending he was a car and these were the headlights and i was doing it at the dinner table and everybody was laughing and having a good time and i think that was one of those times I went, hey i can do what dick van dyke does and people laugh that was probably <laughs> around seven or eight you know it was just that really stays with me that one so i think that was like i found that funny and reacted to it and uh and because of that when i started to get older i really realized it was sid caesar who was my you know gut influence because uh, th when i look back that show was just basically a you know a formation of the sid caesar years so when i found out about the show of shows 
I just went nuts. I bathed into that so much. Just isn't, love it. Isn't that interesting? Now I and I, I sort of pride myself on being a bit of a nostalgist and and I you know just a broadcasting aficionado of everything. But I I actually have not really seen that much Sid Caesar. Of course, it wasn't syndicated or rerun a lot when I was a kid. So now I mean, no. if, I, if I have access to it at all, it's on YouTube and I've seen some yeah. really funny stuff with him and Imogene Coca. And, but how were you able to, how were you accessing it back then? Was it on TV? Was it in reruns? I was, you know, I was working at Second City and I came home one night really late and it was on at two o'clock in the morning. They had like this uh, special 10, 10 episodes from, from show of shows. And I had never seen, I heard of Sid Caesar, but I never saw any of the shows. It was like you, they didn't re rebroadcast when we were young. And it was so good. I couldn't believe how good this guy was. And I just, but again, it was only that one thing. They didn't have much. So I went out and I got books and this and that and every tape I could find, you know, in the history and finding out, you know, there was Woody Allen and, you know, the, the, the everybody who worked on MASH was there. And, oh my oh, God, the Larry, names Larry just go. Galba Larry Gelbart, Larry Gelbart uh, uh, Neil Simon, um, you know, Simon. they just, they all went through it. Yeah, Mel Brooks, obviously, Carl yeah. Reiner. You know, so when I realized, well, that's that's what makes me laugh for those guys. So imagine if they were all in one room feeding one energy who can perform that would be. And they chose Sid Caesar. So I thought that's the guy to follow. So one night, even at Second City, I, I was reading a New York paper. Someone brought back and it's like Sid Caesar and Gene Coco were playing at Michael's Pub in New York. And they're both in their 80s at this point. So, you know, I phoned in sick to Second City like the day before. And my wife and I jumped on a plane, went down and saw them, you know, and did sat in the front right. row and the whole bit. And it was just a little tiny nightclub, you know, they did their sketches from the show. And I was like this kid beaming. And he was like, what are you doing here? No one under 80 is here. Who are you? He was like so fascinated <laughs> that somebody was there. It was just fantastic. That's wonderful. I uh, yeah. well, that was sort of that. That's sort of my feeling about Bob and Ray a little bit. Which I sort of I discovered them in the 90s when um, uh, my girlfriend and I at the time when I were in New York and there was a retrospective of them at the Museum of Broadcasting and I, I just went up and put a set of headphones on and started listening to this stuff from the 50s that was like hilarious. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't like, like I, you know, at that time I was still associated all old comedy with like, you know, who's on, like especially radio with like who's on, yes. you know, stuff like that. Um, but it was so kind of attitude based and kind of subtle and just ironic in a way that stuff from that time is not, you know, in general. No, it's not. No, it's, it's very over the top, that era of, of you know, the Colgate comedy hour and everything they presented and the Pepsi yeah. shows and all the, they were big, big shows. Yeah. Those guys took a while to catch on to be that kind of uh, straightforward, subtle. Then you see like, uh, you know, Nichols and May come along in the sixties kind of imbibing that tone a little bit of more conversation, a little more straightforward, a little more, you have to listen. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it gets just a little hipper, right? Like as yeah. the years go on, because I always like the one guy that I just from that era that I can't go, but like you know Milton Berle, Jesus, I know Mr. Television, but talk about right place, right time, right? Like oh yeah, if it wasn't 1949, the very very beginning of broadcasting, and this guy happening to be there, I mean, I just can't imagine that guy making it. At any other time in in in, in show business, I mean, I no, because he, he wasn't able to act in movies. He wasn't able to carry a sitcom or anything. It was just straight out old old jokes and just. Our, yeah, I had always had a hard time with him too because I thought, is that what is you're supposed to be like? Is that supposed to be funny? Because I'm yeah. not getting it. You know, he's yeah. the king. I don't get it. Why can I listen to him? You listen to me because he's the star. I'm the star. He's star. Now uh, say you're sorry. Yeah, tell me you're sorry. I'm sorry you're a star. I was it's funny how also. Uh, your tastes change over the years. So, so I th I remember you, you saying Dave Van Dyke remind, reminded me that I'm sure you and I spoke about it probably in the lunchroom and whatnot at, at Red Green because I, I'm a huge fan of Dick Van Dyke. I've kind of turned. I, I so I recently this summer I got out some old Honeymooners DVDs. Yes, I still have DVDs, and yes. I and I put a couple on, and I and I realized that I've sort of outgrown the Honeymooners and and that I don't appreciate what Gleason did to the extent that I once did. And I, and, and the things like, I, you know how you would always hear about Gleason? Well, Gleason didn't like to rehearse. He liked to have it fresh on the day and blah, blah, blah. And sometimes when I'm watching those shows, I think to myself, you know, this would be a lot better if they had rehearsed it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There must be plenty of eligible, uh, comp, uh, 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 Applicants. Applicants. I'm sorry, sir. I couldn't think of the word. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, this joke is weak. They could beat this joke or that. Oh, absolutely. You know what I mean? Like, and, I, you know, as a support player, what I often am, 
I, I resented a fact of someone who didn't want to rehearse. And when you watch the show, you see Gleason just kind of push people out of the way when he's talking and stuff. Those actors went with that. They didn't push back or they, they made that work. I thought those other three were really working hard to make oh him look good, God. you know? hundred percent. I mean, if you, yeah. look at, if you look at some of those old, the so-called lost episodes before Audrey Meadows came on, the differences between, I think her name was Perk Kelton. Here's, we're really, I'm really digging. This is a really hip show here. You can see why I have 300 subscribers. Um, but <laughs> I, 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 but you know, sure, I, I, it is, it is so much the work of Audrey Meadows and, and, uh, or I, and, uh, who was a uh, Jane, uh, oh God, Jane, Ra Jane Joyce yeah, Randolph, oh. Joyce Randolph, but, and of course, Art Carney, but you're absolutely yeah. right. And those people had to be, Talk about need, needing to be uh, uh, gracious uh, performers, yeah. in terms of letting him just kind of, kind of do his thing. But, but, it, but the other thing of, of it too is that I think growing up, this is partly just me changing along with the culture because growing up, and you know, when yelling around a household was a slightly more common thing in the seventies and sixties. Yeah maybe even the 80s than it is now and you know people have kind of i when i when i uh when i hear ralph now it's almost i'm not going to use the word traumatizing but it's like this is a this man has no impulse control whatsoever and he's constantly cruel to his wife what's so terrible about learning to do the mambo everybody does it now everybody does it alice everybody does it well i don't mean everybody you said everybody I does it, it. I don't know anybody does the mambo. I don't do it. Norton doesn't do it. My grandmother never did it. And, yeah. And in a way that, I don't know, in the 80s, which is still 30 years after it aired, you could go, oh, that's the Honeymooners and kind of roll along with it. And now when you're watching it, you're like, this guy's kind of abusive. <laughs> like, it's, do you know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. Well, there's so, much of, there's so much TV now that would never make the air now just by the, yeah. the basis of the point of view of it, of where men stand. And this, I was watching a Western the other night and there was this slaughtering of the indigenous people was just like, oh my goodness, this is horrific. But in the fifties, yeah. when they made it, he, they were king, you know, they were savages and all the rest of it. It was just sort of an unspoken given. And when yeah. you look at it now going, because I was taught that, hmm, that's, we could have been taught better things. <laughs> oh, so much, so much that, and I, 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 yeah, I've given a lot of thought to that over the last few years, especially because it, it, it uh, you do, you can't help once that, once those thoughts kind of work their way in there, and and it doesn't make any of that stuff bad or unwatchable necessarily. I mean, particularly when you talk about westerns. I mean, you know, I love old John Wayne westerns. I, I, I think yeah. I would have hated him as an individual. I think the right. movies are great on their own way, but they also don't demand that much participation from from me in the way that a comedy does, because a comedy demands a, a, a response, which is laughter, right? Mm -hmm. and you can that you can't that's a that you can't fake. So it's I find like com maybe comedy sometimes dates more quickly or more easily than maybe maybe drama and action and adventure well same thing i tried i have i tried to watch uh, a night at the opera the other night and, it, oh and that's sort God, of the same God. thing where you go oh yeah the the marx brothers to me are, are great in bits like small sections but watching a two hour and ten minutes is like ah this energy is kind of exhausting you know it, it starts to take away from the scenes that are so good oh, but totally. it, that's one that's a little harder to watch too yeah so funny. well the, the the way they chase women and sexualize women alone oh, is uncomfortable as heck to watch you know yeah and, yeah. and the fact that chico was because he goes with all the girls is like man it's in his name sexual <laughs> sexual harassment's in his name <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Ooh, it's one of those to be continued episodes. Part two with the fabulous Pat McKenna. So glad he came and hung out. Coming up next week. Week after that, we got Pat Thornton, comedian. Last week, we had Pat Walsh. We're in all Pat format now, folks. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Good night.